For any Southern baker, there's nothing more gratifying than serving guests a delicious homemade dessert, whether it's an impressive layer cake or a flaky crusted pie. Today on Martha Bakes, I'll share three of my Southern favorites, plus a fantastic finishing touch for your next cake or cupcake. We have a delightful hummingbird cake, rich and fruity on the inside and very delicious on the outside with pineapple flowers to lure the hummingbirds. And we have a Southern sweet potato pie in a flaky crust. And we also have a hot milk cake covered with a wonderful light chocolate whipped cream frosting. All of these on Martha Bakes today. When it comes to classic Southern layer cakes, hummingbird cake, well, it's high on the list. Some say it got its name because it's as sweet as nectar. Others say it makes you hum with happiness. You decide when you taste it. I'm just chopping up the last of three bananas, which will be incorporated into the batter. Very easy. And the batter whisked together three cups of all-purpose flour, one tablespoon of baking soda, one teaspoon of salt, I tend to use coarse kosher salt, and a teaspoon of cinnamon. Mix this together. And sugar, two whole cups of sugar. In the South, desserts tend to be sweet. Two cups. And this cake does not have butter, it has safflower oil. And now the wet ingredients go right in here. Three large eggs, one cup of high quality safflower oil, and two teaspoons of vanilla. Safflower oil is made from the seeds of the safflower plant, which is related to the sunflower. It's not the same, but it is a pure oil that is flavorless. Just stir this around. We have canned pineapple eight ounces of crushed pineapple, which is traditional in this cake. It smells very good. Very nice. And now the nuts. One cup. Toasted pecans. That's the most popular of the nuts grown in the South. And the bananas. Now we're going to bake three layers of cake. And I'm using eight inch round cake pans oiled with a little bit more safflower oil. Line the bottom of the pan with a round of parchment paper. In a good baking store, you can find these lovely rounds and I'm sure you can find them online also. And we have to divide the batter evenly and the most efficient way is to use a scale. This is a really accurate way to portion out your batter. And these go right into a 350 degree oven. It's going to take anywhere from 25 to 30 minutes to bake. So these are the three cake layers. Let them cool in their pans on wire racks for about 20 minutes, then invert onto a rack like this. And notice how dark they've become. This is the beauty of this particular cake. So uh, let these really cool for at least one hour and make your frosting. I have a cake stand right here with a uh, rotating top. I put these pieces of parchment underneath my cake round just to keep the frosting on the cake and not on the pedestal itself. To lift these layers, use a spatula and put the first layer on a cake round. Now the frosting is so simple. Eight ounces of cream cheese at room temperature and eight ounces of unsalted butter at room temperature. Mix it together, a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. A little salt in the sweet is always good. Just really brings out the flavor. And two teaspoons of best quality vanilla extract. Once the cream cheese and the butter mix, then you add five cups of sifted confectioner's sugar. Cream cheese frosting is really versatile, it's tangy, and it's quick to prepare, and everybody seems to like it. And it uses cream cheese, which is a soft, unripened cheese made from cow's milk. And by law, that cheese must contain at least 33% milk fat and not more than 55% moisture. American uh, cream cheese was an attempt to replicate the style of French 
Neufchatel cheese. William A. Lawrence was the first American dairyman to make cream cheese in New York State in 1872. So they're all done. And now, easiest way to apply it is with a large ice cream scoop. It's about one cup of icing in between each layer. That's two of these scoops. Spread that. And the beauty of these turntables is making every part of the cake accessible. Now this is a stiff frosting and the cake is moist and soft, so just be careful not to tear the cake. Your next layer. Putting a cake on a cake round is a bit of added security. And these rounds are available in all different sizes at baking supply stores and online. So there's that layer and then your last layer. Cover the entire sides of the cake so that you don't see any of that beautiful, dark, moist cake. And after tasting this, you'll know why it's become a Southern classic. A little later on, we'll show you a great way to decorate this cake so it is as festive as you can imagine. In colonial days, sweet potatoes became a Southern favorite because of the beautiful color, the wonderful taste, and the fact that sweet potatoes were very easy to grow in the South. And today I want to show you how to make a sweet potato pie. Vardam in Mississippi is the sweet potato capital of the world and hosts an annual sweet potato festival featuring a pie eating contest and a sweet potato king and queen competition. That's how important the sweet potato is to the South. Now, a nice alternative to pumpkin, especially if you don't like pumpkin, you're going to love sweet potato pie. Choose four sweet potatoes of equal size. I just make a few fork holes in it and get this right into a 400 degree oven and roast them until they are soft. It takes at least an hour. And while the sweet potatoes are roasting, it's a good idea to get your crust ready. This recipe calls for a blind baked crust. And it's a pot brise. It's been chilled. That makes it easier to roll. And we'll get it rolled out into a nice round without falling apart. If it's well-made pot brise, it does that. Work on a floured surface, and I like to keep churning the dough so that I'm getting a nice even thickness to my round. I like baking these pies in a glass pie plate. It bakes really well. This is a nine inch pie plate, and once you get the pastry to an even thinness, just roll it up. This is the easiest way to transfer from your rolling surface to your dish, unfurl it. I like to use a scissor just to cut off the excess. I leave about a half inch overhang. And here I'm folding under the edge so that I can nicely flute it. And if your dough becomes a little too soft, get it right back into the refrigerator. Just a little bit of chilling will make it much, much easier to handle. So you see that looks good and everybody has a different way of making a fluted crust. But if you use your two forefingers and your thumb, you can shape your crust very nicely. And this crust calls for blind baking, which means we're going to pre-bake the crust so that when we get the sweet potato filling ready, we pour that filling into the crust and then bake it again. Use a fork to dock the bottom of your crust. This will help the crust cook evenly and prevent bubbles or eruptions in the baking of the crust. Chill it now. And here's that gorgeous, gorgeous crust, all chilled. Oh, and make sure your oven is preheated to 375 degrees. We want to line this with parchment paper. So I have a nice round of parchment paper. A little hard to put that big round in there, so I just crumple up my paper. And now it will fit much more easily into the bottom of the crust. It works really, really well. And then pour your mixture of weights. I just use an assortment of different dried beans that I use over and over again as weights. And they fill all the nooks and crannies and do a very fine job of weighting down the crust. Get this right into your 375 oven and bake until the pastry begins to color around the edges a 
about 30 minutes. Then you're going to remove the beans and parchment and continue to bake until the pastry is dried out and turns a light golden color, uh, about 10 minutes more. And our sweet potatoes are miraculously ready, cooled, and we will start making the filling. So here's our beautiful pie crust. The underside is a lovely golden brown. The sweet potatoes have cooled also, and we need two and a half cups of sweet potatoes. And they peel very easily by hand, just peel off the skin, which is loosened from the flesh by the baking. And we need two and a half cups of potato puree. And you can measure ahead of time. This looks like one cup. Just put this in your food processor. And uh, this is exactly two and a half cups, so no problem. We'll just put this in and puree it nicely. So just process those potatoes until they're smooth. Yeah, that's good. So that will go right into our bowl when we're ready. And into a large mixing bowl, three large eggs. Whisk those up. Uh, one and a half cups of half and half. Your sweet potato mixture. Good, deep color. That's what we want. You might ask, well, why not use canned sweet potato? This is so infinitely superior and so easy. There's no reason to use the canned variety. And sweet potatoes are readily available everywhere now. As soon as you get this pretty well mixed, add four tablespoons of melted cooled butter and a quarter of a teaspoon of salt, a half a teaspoon of allspice. So two quarter teaspoons of allspice and three quarters of a teaspoon of cinnamon. Freshly grated nutmeg, about an eighth of a teaspoon fragrant and delightful. And the zest of a lemon, about a teaspoon. Now your oven at this point should be preheated to 400 degrees. And don't forget a third of a cup of sugar. And that's the filling. Very similar to pumpkin pie. Pour this right into your beautiful pie crust. It should be just about enough. Right into the oven. It'll come out in about 50 minutes. Wait till you see it baked. The pie is baked. Cool it completely before slicing. And just lift that out. Mm. Looks so good. Serve and delight. This delicious sweet potato pie is a southern favorite that really can't be beat. Try it instead of pumpkin. Now here's an unusual cake that's extra delicious. It's called hot milk cake. The secret to its moist texture and fluffy crumb is the scalded milk added to the sugar and egg mixture. And for the finishing touch, I'm going to cover mine with swirls of chocolate whipped cream frosting. One and a half cups of whole milk and two tablespoons of butter Bring it to a boil, but be careful it doesn't boil over and make a mess all over your stove. In the bowl of an electric mixer, put six large eggs. Break up the eggs and add three cups of sugar. I like to add the sugar gradually, just like that. And you want the sugar to incorporate and create a really light and fluffy yellow mixture. Creaming the eggs and the sugar like this until thick and pale creates really tiny air bubbles. And that helps the batter rise very nicely. And we also use one tablespoon of baking powder in our dry ingredients. And you can also add two teaspoons of vanilla to your egg and sugar mixture. So let that beat and beat. And now whisk together three cups of all-purpose unbleached white flour, one tablespoon of baking powder, and a teaspoon of salt. The milk has come to a boil, and it is ready to pour right into that nice creamy yellow mixture. 
Be careful not to let it splatter all over the place. And then add the flour mixture a little bit at a time. We don't want to beat this too, too much. So do it quickly and get the stuff incorporated. There. So release the beater. And then pour it evenly, even amounts, into each of the nine inch pans. And how do we know if it's even? Eyeball it. But if you're unsure of yourself, use a scale. The pans have been buttered and floured. And put these in a 325 degree oven. Make sure it's preheated. Bake until golden brown and starting to pull away from the pan. About 55 to 60 minutes. It's essential not to overbake this cake. And now for the frosting. In a saucepan, bring four cups of heavy cream to a boil. Add eight ounces of semi-sweet chocolate, the best you can find, and stir until the chocolate is completely melted. Off heat, just turn your heat off. Don't use half and half, don't use light cream. It just won't have the same result. Let that cool, cover it, and you have to chill this overnight until it's thick and cold. So you see this is much thicker than heavy cream. The chocolate helps thicken that up. And we're going to whip this as we would a bowl of cream to get that beautiful, light, fluffy frosting. Use the whisk attachment on your mixer. You can do this with a hand mixer if you like. It'll take a while. And get your cake pedestal ready for frosting. I use these four pieces of parchment paper just to keep everything from getting messy. And I'll put my bottom layer. Oh, what a beautiful cake. So that looks perfect. See how it changes consistency? An interesting, easy frosting. But of course, this is not the frosting to use if you are going to have this cake outdoors on a buffet in the summertime. This is a delicate frosting that is really best when it's cold. So about a cup of it in between the layers. And we have a lot of this, so you don't have to skimp on the filling. And now we can add the next layer. Slather this wonderful frosting all over the cakes, filling in those sides nicely. And you can be as decorative as you like. You could actually pipe this on the cake if you want and make a more formal design and take the frosting all the way down to the parchment paper. Parchment paper is fantastic. These are all good tips that the home baker should know. So there, just remove your parchment strips. And I would put this right back into the refrigerator until you're ready to serve it. It'll stiffen up a little bit more, and it will be one of the most beautiful, delicious cakes you've ever tasted. And this is a cinch to make. Joining me in the kitchen now is Jason Schreiber, who's known an artist's kitchen for his fabulous cake decorating skills. And today, well, it's not so far off because you're making the final touches for our hummingbird cake. Yeah. We're great lovers of dried fruits, dried orange rounds, dried apples, even dried pears. But how about dried pineapple? Since the cake has pineapple in it, well, why don't you show our viewers how to make pineapple rounds? So uh, it's really easy. It's great because you can just do it with almost any fruit. I'm just going to start by peeling the pineapple, but I'm not going to core it. So you leave the core in. Yeah, you leave the core in because you need it to have the center of the flower. I'm just going to cut the bottom off as well. And I, because I like to make juice out of everything, I'll use the whole skin for my green juice in the morning. Yeah, we'll save it for you for tomorrow. Okay. So I'm just going to peel this with a serrated knife, and you want to make sure that you really get all of the little eyes out. So I'm going to keep slicing yeah, oranges. Yeah, so you do those oranges. Okay. Very hard to get an orange really paper thin. And what temperature should the oven be set at for these fruit so drying? You want it to be as low as your oven can go. So for most people, that's probably about 225. 
And it'll just sort of depend on how thickly you slice the fruit and what temperature you can get it down to, but it like should take about an hour. On the oranges, do you put anything on it, any, any sugar, no, anything? No, nothing on it. It's the same technique for all the fruit, which is great. You can just use whatever you have available. And if you have a dehydrator, would that help? Oh, that would be great if you have yeah. a dehydrator. I have one at home, and I usually do this kind of stuff in the dehydrator. All right, so now I'm just gonna try to slice this as thinly as humanly possible. <laughs> You can usually get them about an eighth of an inch thick. If you can go thinner. I'm pretty good, look. I'll, yeah, that's pretty good. And if you had a deli slicer, that'd be great. And we're just gonna... So how much time uh, do you think? So for those, I would say the oranges take about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Now sometimes I put powdered sugar on these. I've heard that. And they come out really nicely for breakfast. Then if you serve a section grapefruit, you can put the candied citrus on it. Look how pretty they look. Oh, I love how this looks. So we're just gonna transfer it to a sheet pan with a nonstick baking mat and get it right into the oven. And they do shrink up in the oven a little bit, so you can put them pretty close together. Pineapple also takes about an hour? The pineapple takes longer. It doesn't take a lot of active time, but you do have to sort of plan ahead. Yeah. All right, so once your pan is full, just put it right into the oven. And those can go in there yep. too, thanks. All right, and so you want to keep it in the oven basically until it's dry but still pliable. Comes out about the texture of fruit leather. Do you have some that are already yeah, do. done? Oh, so they shrink a lot. Yeah, they shrink a lot. They get a nice sort of golden color to them. Mm -hmm. So these are still moist. These are still moist. This is how they come out of the mm -hmm. oven. But they're moist enough to push right into these muffin cups. And they'll dry in there. They dry in there. It takes another bit of time. So you do have to plan ahead with in this In the recipe. oven? No, nope, just oh. at room temperature. And it'll depend on the humidity, the weather. So this isn't something you can do the day that you want to serve it. You should really try to do it the day before at least. Plan to make your beautiful flowers, your pineapple flowers, at least the day before your hummingbird At least the cake. day before. Okay. And then you'll just leave this at room temperature. Don't cover it because you want to make sure that the moisture has somewhere Are to go. Are those done already? And these ones we did a couple days ago. Oh. They come out and they just look. keep their shape. Mm. They definitely look like flowers. And I think we're going to decorate the hummingbird cake that you made earlier. I'll do the cupcakes. Okay. And I want to see how you're going to do the cake. So I think it's nice to just make a little pile of them in the center of the cake. It kind of gives you something to focus on and it makes the cake look a little bit bigger even. And you don't need too much. It's probably better to keep it simple. So I'm just going to look for a small one maybe that I can nestle inside. Don't you have, en have to have enough for each slice of cake? Well, you can serve them on the side. You don't have to get them all onto the cake. It's more important that it look good when you're presenting it, I think. Yeah, it's so, so beautiful. Yeah, and it's so such beautiful. a simple way to finish something. And the cupcakes look so cute like this. And it's the same batter for the cupcakes. Yeah, we took the same hummingbird cake recipe. We just baked it. It made about two dozen cupcakes, 22 minutes in the oven. Fantastic. Well, dried fruit can add color and texture and a bit of whimsy to your favorite cakes and cupcakes. Try it with pineapple flowers next time. Jason, thank you very much, and thank you all for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. Melt and cool your chocolate. Use a small paintbrush to paint the underside of fresh mint, lemon leaves, lime leaves, whatever. Drape the leaves over the handle of a wooden spoon. You'll want to refrigerate the leaves until they're set. Using tweezers, gently grasp the chocolate layer and peel off while holding the stem. These may be stored refrigerated for up to two days.